exiting the paint and I'm trying to make it as even as possible and, and have a drop size that's not too large for this pattern. So I'm controlling the drop size in the placement. Now this is the Prussian blue. Oops. That's, that's way too big, so I've got to kind of knock some paint off my whisk. The whisk is just broom cord. Same thing that brooms are made with. And um, <clears throat> as simple as it is, broom cord, I can kind of make it do what I want it to do by hitting it with different um, amounts of pressure and putting different amounts of paint on it. And to get way up here high, I can spread the paint out more evenly. So that's, that's about right. I'm going to pop lots some small drops in between. And now I'm going to bring a rake into this. So the rake, I'm going to use the thin rod rake. Mm -hmm. It's very thin rods of uh, stainless steel. And I'm going to pull through the water. When you pull through the water, the paint's going to follow the tool and hits the surface, and you can really get an interesting effect. Gotta be careful though, if you move it too fast, it'll keep going and move beyond the point at which you're trying to achieve that pattern. See so here? Very mm -hmm. carefully. Good morning, or is it good afternoon yet? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today to help us celebrate Felix Valley's 200th birthday, the house. Um, we're just here wanting to have a good time. Everybody have fun and just celebrate with us. In a little while, we're going to have fiddle music, then a straw mat. We've had our dulcimer player, and we're going to have bagpipes. Rick Thumb is a really great dulcimer player, so I hope we get him back up here for several more rounds. I would also like to present the militia, but first I'd like for Jim Baker to say a few words. Jim Baker was here 28 years. You took care of this house, and now it's mine. But I want him to uh, say a few curl. words about it. 18. All the way into the late 1800s. Thank you, thank you, Donna. It's a uh, pleasure to be back. The and go back to this, as always, uh, and an even uh, mm -hmm. greater pleasure to be back at the Felix Valley House mm -hmm. in the back porch. Um, this is a place that's special, dear to my heart. Um, uh, when you when you're here for as long as I was, you feel like Felix and Odile are your friends, your neighbors, your parents, whatever. Um, but. I think you will all agree that St. Genevieve is a marvelous, marvelous place. Preservation here is kind of an unparalleled thing, and we are fortunate that all organizations like the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Missouri um, take this preservation seriously and make places like this open to the public and available to be interpreted and understood and enjoyed. So it's a real pleasure to be here on the 200th anniversary of the construction of the house, I want to just point out, uh, since maybe some of you have been through on the tour, some of you might not, the house was actually built by a gentleman whose name was Jacob Philipson. We need to make sure he gets his due. He's the gentleman who had the foresight to build the house for his business and residence back in 1818. So we owe him a big debt of gratitude. And of course, the valet family carried the house on through the rest of the 19th century. Then the Rozier family here in St. Genevieve brought us up to 1970 when they were kind enough to donate the house to the state of Missouri. So we owe all those families a big debt of gratitude for making this place, uh, preserving this place, and allowing it to be part of the state historic site system for the state parks. I want to thank Donna for inviting me back to uh, your big celebration. and. Uh, show my appreciation for her for all the hard work she's done to continue to develop the historic site and make it what it is today. We owe her a big round of applause and a big debt of gratitude. Now you understand Donna's going to be a busy lady and I don't know if she realizes this uh, in the next few years, but the 200th anniversary of the Shaw House 
will be coming up in 2019. And this house will have been a state historic site for 50 years in, uh, in uh, the celebration will be the next year in 2020. So Donna, just keep on with the cake and uh, the music and all the people. We're delighted to be here. We're delighted you're here. I hope you enjoy the great afternoon she's got planned. Thanks very much, everybody.
know what got me? I got some pins. And those are great gifts. I got, I bought one last week. Oh, I got it. Can you tell me what you're doing? My name is Jim Phillips. Jim Phillips? I am working on a sash for a friend using finger weaving. How long have you been doing this, Jim? Since I was 18. Is that right? So, better part of... Oh, don't give it away now. Or so. <laughs> 30 years, I guess. That makes me feel old. Do you work with different materials? or Different materials. This is wool. I've also worked with cotton and then fibers like uh, dog vein and stinging nettle. And all the dyes are natural dyes. So you're working with how many different colors in there? This one has three. Three? Although one of them's really close to the purple, so you can't really see it, unfortunately. What's the most color you've worked with at one time? 36. 36 colors? It was very wide. Okay, wow. And it was really more of a test swatch than it was an actual uh, did anything with it. I will admit that that particular one got me very frustrated and I walked away from it. Then cut it up into smaller projects. With this, you don't have a loom, so you have to maintain the downward tension and the string tension at the same time, or else it gets very lumpy. So you're making cornmeal. Yes, sir. Trying to make some cornmeal and hopefully have enough maybe by the end of the day to make a pan of cornbread with. So we'll <laughs> see this, how it goes. <laughs> what's this instrument you're using? Here? Um, it's actually called a corn pounder. It's like a really big version of a mortise and pestle. Oh, okay. So and this is what they would have used uh, a long time ago before they had grist mills um, to make their cornmeal with. Before this, uh, the Native Americans would have used saddle stones to grind their corn with, and then uh, the corn pounder came along, and then the next thing was a uh, small kind of personalized set of millstones that people would keep on their farms that was called corn. And then after that, um, they started building big grist mills like where I work at Bollinger Mill. Okay. And um, people were thrilled when grist mills came along because they were able to take their corn or their wheat to these grist mills and um, work a deal with the miller. And the miller would charge what they called a toll, and that was just where they would keep a portion of the finished product. And it worked out great because the miller could turn around and sell the toll for payment. And uh, it worked out great for the farmers because they weren't having to grind their corn at home by hand anymore. So, so the grist mills were really, you know, a godsend for farmers. 
And of course, you know, now <laughs> we have it so easy because we can just go to a grocery store and buy a bag of cornmeal or buy a bag of flour. But, you know, sometimes we kind of forget that it, it took a lot of work, you know, just to, you know, get through everyday life back then. So, Where's the Bollinger Mill located? That is located in Burfordville, Missouri. It's in the western part of Cape Girardeau County. Okay. And uh, we have the Bollinger Mill. Uh, they construction, finished construction on it in 1867, uh, but the foundation actually dates from an older mill that was built in 1825. That mill actually got burned during the Civil War. Oh. And uh, we also have the Burfordville Cover Bridge there. It, there's only four cover bridges left in the state of Missouri, and the Burfordville Cover Bridge is the oldest one. So. I'll scoop some of this out and we'll take a look and see if we've got any, uh, if we're getting any cornmeal yet. Let's see if I can find my scoop real quick. There you are. I don't know how Because it's, it's a two-part process. Anytime you make cornmeal, you got to crush it up. But then you also have to sift it because you won't really know if you've got anything until you start sifting it. Right, we'll take a look. Whoa, we've got a little bit. <laughs> it's not much, but you know, it takes a while before you get enough. Wow. But you can kind of see in the screen, you know, we we're busting it up. You know, we're getting these cracked pieces, which you know, this is getting toward cracked corn which was great to feed your chickens with so and sometimes people will come to mills for that so <laughs> but it's a slow going process but you get it eventually and it really makes you appreciate you know just being able to go to the store now <laughs> and pick up a bag of cornmeal or a bag of flour so great thanks for your time yeah no problem Rinse and repeat, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, and of course, you know, all the wedding applications for the year. About 10 minutes later, you'll have a candle. I'm always processing wedding applications, like, every day, it seems like this time of year. How hot is this over here? Right now, it's really warm. Um, it's boiling. And then we'll turn it off once it gets all melted and... Probably another 10 minutes or so, we'd turn it back on. Just uh, it's one of them things where it's either going to be boiling or off. <laughs> but the lower temperature it is, the faster the candle will build up. And if you have it too hot, it'll just melt that wax back off of there. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I try, anytime I have free time, if I can help somebody out, you know, I'm usually going in the library and there are files digging through stuff. Wait for a little bit, so I didn't see that there were blank pages. Yeah, even if you were looking, if you were, like, reading it, that's the only way you I, See, I just thought that it was all there. I yeah, didn't know I if there was pages missing out of it. And then I got to talking to Leslie, and I'm like... Do we not have and you can shape copy? it too if it's a little she's bit. Like, no, she's like they've never uh, given us a full copy. Getting weird, so, you can I guess there's one up in Make it straight again. Somewhere. But then somehow the Cape County Archives got a hold of a full copy. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I don't know if when Jack was there, if they, you know, were able to procure a copy from him or how how that happened. Yeah. But <laughs> anyways, at least there, you know. At least you have one close by. Yeah, at <laughs> least there's a full copy, you know, close by, so. And you can make your candle as <laughs> thick or as little as you it's want fun. it. It's fun. Y'all should try it, so. <laughs> this would probably be about as little as I would want mine. Yeah, nice to meet you. Good to see you, Megan. Get a 
face. That is Chelsea. She's the one that seems to be up here at the yes. valley. She's the one. You got you a candle. Uh, Thank you. Megan. Thank you. Look, I don't know if she's working. Put on a contraption like that. I would be a cook. Huh? <laughs> How are you? What are you mixing up there? Cornbread. Cornbread. Samples in about ten minutes, I think. Oh. Oh. Hi, Jen. Hi. You want to tell us a little about the pens you have here? Sure. Well, all of our pens are made by uh, Mary Thrasher from Thrasher's Turnings. Um, we have a wide variety of pens available today, as well as the special order from our Etsy site. We have uh, a custom olive wood pen made from Bethlehem Olive Wood. We have several bolt action pens that are made from 30 caliber bullets. And actually have a bolt action with a rifle accent. Um, we also have several lever actions. Pens. We also have um, one from the Civil War that features several different, um, there's several different pieces from Civil War guns. Um, we have several different pens in honor of masons, police, policemen, firefighters. So we have a wide variety of pens. We used to raise them. What's this one in the case here? This is a deer hunter pen. So this is actually um, like a deer trophy, and then this is actually made from real deer antler. Oh, okay. And then a little rifle case to... Oh, super. Thank you for your time, John. Oh, no problem. Hi, Michael. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your hobby. Uh, well, it's become my business now. Um, I've had a long time interest in black powder weapons, especially percussion military weapons, and uh, I started working on them. And uh, I do restorations, uh, I accurize or make more authentic uh, reproduction muskets, for mostly for Civil War reenactors, and uh, collect them as I go along. Uh, this one I was going to show you is, you know, this is a horse pistol, so it's a muzzle loader kind of hard to load on a horse, right? Well, it's pretty ingenious. You put the rammer on a swivel so you don't lose it. So you can fire, you know, they're single shots. You can fire it, ram a new round down in there. Whoops, set right. And you're ready to go again. These are all percussion in, uh, weapons. Uh, they were the successor to the uh, flintlocks. In fact, <clears throat> some of these, for example, this 1806 has been converted from a flintlock to be made into a percussion. <clears throat> and that was fairly common. You find a lot of 1816 Springfields that were also converted to uh, percussion, where they saw the pan off for the flat lock and then put a percussion cone in there and uh, reissue them. The percussion system was more reliable, uh, predecessor to the system we have now, which uses the cartridges, the brass cartridges, and the cartridges, which you started seeing at the time of the Civil War, uh, or even before. For example, this one is a pin fire. It has a brass cartridge. This was French in design. It comes out around 1835 or so. You could find pin fires through the 1870s. And if you notice, it has a brass cartridge, but it's got this little pin sticking out. That's the primer. So in a... Uh, 
you have a, a pistol similar to this, but instead of where the cone is for a percussion cap, there would be a notch. And you would place the bullet in, and the primer would stick up through the notch, and then the hammer hits the primer. Pretty, pretty ahead of its time. <laughs> because this comes out when flintlocks are still being used. For example, you get into the Mexican War, you still find a lot of flintlocks being used by the U.S. Army. But you also find things like this. The 1841 Springfield, otherwise called the Mississippi Rifle. Uh, it got its name because Jeff Davis, Jefferson Davis, who became President of the Confederate States, led a regiment of Mississippi soldiers and they were armed with 41 Springfields. And it kind of became known as the Mississippi Rifle. <laughs> and you can see it's percussion. Mm -hmm. So it was being used at the same time with, uh, with the uh, flintlocks. By the end of the Civil War, the percussion system is fading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more and more cartridges being made. For example, here you have a 52 caliber Spencer. You can see it's a metal cartridge and it's very much like a modern 22. It's a rim fire in that the paste for the primer is in the rim and wherever it's struck it detonates the, the powder inside. And so shortly after the war, the Army goes to um, breech loading metallic cartridges. For example, with the, uh, well, the Spencer was one, the uh, rolling block rifle, the, uh, the 45-70 breech loader. So you're looking at a, a system that was popular for about three decades, and then technology makes it pass it. Although you still see the percussion system used well into the 20th century in civilian arms, especially shotguns. I have quite a few double barrel shotguns from the 1800s and they're all percussion. Even into the 1910s, 1920s, you can still find some percussion shotguns. But the military had moved past. This is my infield. We were talking about infields. Uh -huh. Show you kind of the differences in it. Well, one, I've got a set of stamps. This is a Birmingham. And so I put the maker's name, an acceptance stamp, Birmingham Small Arms Trade. <coughs> Took the modern markings off, stripped the bluing and rust blued the barrel. Uh, stripped the uh, lock plate has proper stamps on it which are incorrect on the Italian ones and installed some original swivels you don't have one up there and this is an original snap cap although it did have leather on it the leather's gone that would allow the hammer to rest on the, the cone without damaging it And recontoured the stock, took a lot off the butt, recontoured the lock plates, defined them a little better. I mean, the lock panels, defined them better. What's the difference in the weight after you're done? Is it the same or is it? It can be. Uh, there's two major makes of Italian. Civil War arms are in infields, the Euro arms, and the Army Sport. The Army Sport is considerably lighter as it is than the Euro arms. I don't know why the Euro arms are so heavy, but you can tell a Euro arms as soon as, soon as you pick it up, <laughs> just from the weight. And they're made in different ways. The Army Sport is made more like uh, the Birmingham infield. Um, the Euro arms is made closer to the London Armory style. So, depending on what I get to work on, if it's a Euro Arms, I make it a London Armory rifle. If it's an Army Sport, I make it a Birmingham rifle. Well, thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. You bet.